Good morning. Welcome to right on time. Um, welcome to the Downtown Design Review Committee meeting for August fifteenth, two thousand thirteen. I've already done this. Please turn off your phone so they don't ring in the middle of the session. And first item, roll call. Betsy Brunstetter. Present. Gigi Faulkner. Present. Charles Ainsworth. Present. Ike Akinwande. Present. Stan Carroll. Here. Connie Scothorn. Here. Richard Tannenbaum. Present. You have a quorum. Great. Um, we need to approve the minutes. Move. Has everybody had? Oh, okay. Everyone's ready. Right. Move to approve. We have a second? second. Okay, that was a Tannenbaum and Ike question, uh, motion. All in favor of approving the minutes? Any opposed? Thank you very much. I do want to do a little um, a housekeeping, let's call it, item or communication item. This is Stan Carroll's last meeting with us. And um, I just want to tell him how much we'll miss him, but he's going to have a great year in London, right? Okay. We're very, very excited for you. Um, we have no cases withdrawn, no cases continued, no cases on the consent docket. Um, we have cases for individual consideration. 509 Northwest 7th Street, is the applicant present? Could you state your name and write your name down on the piece of paper in front of you, please? Brian Fitzsimmons, Fitzsimmons Architects, on behalf of the applicant. And here's the other half. Just walked in. We heard this case last month. Do you have anything yes. to add to what you? Um, well, we heard the case last month, and I know we had many discussions last month. Uh, since that time, I believe everyone visited the site, and uh, I'm not sure that there's a whole lot more to add to that. Other, than if there's any questions from you to us related to site visit. Do you have any more details on what would take the place of that? No. Okay. Discussion? Oh, I would be interested to know um, who on the committee visited the structure. I know I did. So almost everyone? No, everyone okay. but Chuck was able to go. And Gigi and I had a very interesting experience. We got almost got mauled by a feral cat. <laughs> so that was yeah. That uh, <laughs> I think that's bad. <laughs> any any discussion? Well, I'd like to, I'd just like to hear what you guys. Well, Scotty, I'd just like to hear what you saw besides the feral cat. Well, Scotty, in her recommendation, says if you if you think it's historical, deny it. If you don't think it's historical, basically, then approve it. So I think that's <clears throat> our significant, not significant, different words. I think that's where we're at. The struggle that I have with it is it is a building that stands alone. It could probably be renovated and um, used. Right now it's a life safety hazard because um, we could have any number of people either getting into the, the building or falling down into the basement steps. That's the, the worst part of that. Um, it also sits on a piece of property that's in downtown design review, and the setback is considerably further back than we would allow normally. So those are two observations. Stan, you had something. Oh, I, uh, <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, what I what I saw was the building was in pretty good shape. I mean, horribly maintained. You know, com there's no maintenance happening. 
of any sort or any real effort to keep vagrants out or anything, or at least I couldn't see any evidence of it. And um, um, what I, I see it as a bigger question, perhaps one that, you know, we don't, this is possibly a precedent setter for other types of structures of a similar situation where they're historical in nature, yet um, owners aren't interested in putting any more money into it because maybe they have bigger visions or other visions anyway. And so what, what I'm kind of caution, trying to caution the commission against is, is allowing that just because an owner doesn't want to maintain a property that he purchased, um, we shouldn't use demolition as a mode of, of maintaining historical properties. Um, it seems like, um, and this is not the first time this project has happened, or this type of a movement has happened, where somebody just doesn't want to maintain because they have other visions down the road, but so they demo it just because they're, that basically wipes out any possible maintenance costs. And so I just hate to see that be our mindset as far as, uh, Otherwise, you know, all these old, great old buildings are going to go away, whether you really want them to or not. So, anyway, that's my piece that I'd like to share. Anybody else? Yeah, I'll share a little bit. Um, I, I thought that it was in pretty good shape also. Um, I did note that there were some issues. You could see some cracking in some of the brick on the back side. Um, but I, I struggle a little bit, too, because um, as... Stan mentioned this is somewhat of a president setter. But I was looking at how this structure, it says it retains most of the seven national registers, register aspects of integrity, location, materials, design, worksmanship, feeling, and association. It's really hard for us to, for me to turn my back on um, the historical significance of this, especially not knowing what may come in the future to replace it, not having any vision or sight of that. Um, I agree with both of you gentlemen, the building's in decent shape. Uh, I'm a developer, so from my perspective, if this was outside of the downtown design review, it would have been down. You know, I know the guys knew that they had that property when they purchased it. So I'm reading what Scotty is saying. Is it significant or is it not significant? From my perspective, regardless of the shape it's in or not, regardless of the maintenance, uh, regardless of what they're going to do with it, and these particular developers have restored some phenomenal structures in Midtown, just one after another after another. Uh, so uh, from my perspective, as a developer, it is not a significant building, and I, would, I have no issue with them taking it down. I think uh, it, the precedent setting, I can see that, but we still here are discussing each one on an individual basis with its own merits. And we will continue to do that. So from my perspective, as a developer, as a building that's not significant to anything or anybody, uh, I, I would have no issue in approving or move to approve. But, you know, I also hear what you guys are saying. And, and that's what we're, we're talking about. Absolutely. Uh, anybody else? Yeah, I just have to agree with, I think this unit is, can be re rehabilitated easily. I hate the idea of people moving to the downtown area so that they can be around the old buildings when we tear down the old buildings. That's my first thought. And my second thought was, remember last month when we had a presentation by the people that are developing down in Bricktown, and they built this huge complex around these little bitty buildings and saved them. And that was so respectful of those buildings, and I feel like this building can manage to survive if we let it. I, I think it is, I, I agree with Dick that the nature of real estate is that it is very unique in location and structure and everything. So each case is, is so individual. Um, I do have a problem with demolition, which we take very seriously on this committee, without knowing what is to take its place and, and having a big picture. That, that, bothers me. In the greater scheme of what we're to do as far as just advancing downtown and, and the other transitional districts as well. Anybody else? Chuck, do you have a 
Any thoughts? You know, it's a I mean, I didn't tour the structure, but I, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm with Dick. I mean, you know, if I'm a developer, I'm going to tear it down and do something bigger. The concern I have is, is all about the precedence that this thing may set. Um, you know, I, I, if I'm a developer, I'd want to tear it down. Is it a public health or public safety issue? Maybe. Um, I think that, that other owners, and I can point to a building at Fifth and Harrison as an example, you can secure a vacant building until you figure out what you want to do with it. And I'm not sure that at some point in time this committee would uh, approve tearing it down. Um, like I say, I'm more concerned about the precedent of the deal. Um, I think it could be secured and not be a, a health hazard till, till some plan develops that, that could take it forward. On the other hand, these guys have done tremendous work down in Midtown. I mean, every project they do is first class. Um, so it's, I mean, it's tough. I mean, I struggle with this, um, uh, this situation. Um, how long do you think it'll be before there's a plan developed, Brian? I mean, um, is it a month, a year, 10 years? I would estimate probably it would be looked at carefully within six months. Can we, well, what? can we ask the owner to come forth? Yeah, they would be better to speak to that. Chris Fleming, 1225 North Broadway Avenue. The question was, when could we expect plans? Um, I, you know, Brian says six months, but I, don't, I wouldn't say that. I mean, we've got half a dozen other projects probably in front of us to plan, and, and those would be a bigger scale and at, at different locations. Um, I mean, the, the fact of the matter is it's a 3,000 square foot building that nobody famous lived in. It, it might have cute architectural charm as it sits today, um, but I mean, it, there's no, it's, it's an old building versus historic building. I mean, that, that's, my, that's my point. Um, you know, it was, a, it was a four or five year old survey that identified it as a, as a particularly, you know, potentially historic structure. Um, that was when there were other structures around it. Now it sits out of context with nothing around it. Um, and, and it's in our eyes, and we've done a lot, I mean, we have half a dozen, or excuse me, we have a dozen projects that are on the National Register of Historic Places and some that we've just put on there just, you know, just, just to have on there um, with, with no incentive to do so. And this is not one of those projects. Just so you know, we're, we're not taking this lightly, as you can uh, tell. I understand, and I, and I appreciate that. I mean, <clears throat> I, and I know that there are bigger structures um, that are going to be coming down you guys' way that, that, you know, you have to be careful what you do here. But what I, what I would say is, again, on a case-by-case -case basis, I mean, this isn't the Stage Center or this isn't the Indian Temple building. I mean, these... This, this building is, is not, I mean, there's nothing historic about this building other than it's old. Uh, I mean, we, we ran the, uh, the poll correctories on it to see if anybody lived there or anything like that. And it's just been a, a little quadplex, multi-tenant you know, multi apartment building. You know, the Mayfair building that we have at 1315 Broadway Place, just, just behind the uh, Mercedes used car dealership, the former United Way building. Um, you know, that building was historically an apartment building. It had, you know, 15, 20 something units. But you know who lived there? Pearl Mesta lived there. Otto Skirvin lived there. Um, people, you know, people like that, there, there was a history to that building. Whereas this, you know, John Smith and, and his wife Jane maybe lived there. You know, not, not anybody that has been necessarily significant in, in the, um, you know, in the course of city history or the course of neighborhood history. And so I think that's, that might be where I, I would argue with you guys until I'm out of breath is, is that this is not a historic building. This is an old building. Okay. Thank, thank you, Chris. <clears throat> yeah, is there anyone in the galley that would like to um, speak to this project? Okay, do we have any motions?
You know, I, I hear what Chris is saying. I mean, and I, and I agree. My wife does estate sales and stuff, and just because it's old doesn't necessarily mean it's good. And um, I'm inclined to make a motion to demolish it. Okay. We have a motion to approve the application and a second. And do you want to elaborate on that motion at all? Relative to the staff report. I mean, I, I think Dick summed it up. It's either um, historically significant or not, and I, I tend to agree it's not historically significant. I mean, Catherine Montgomery works for you guys, doesn't she? I mean, what does she say? I mean, she will throw her body across a, a building that's of <laughs> historic significance to keep it from being torn down. Yeah, and, and, she, and she's who we had do the historic research on the building and, and her staff, and, and there, other than... It's an old building, and it was representative of the time. There's nothing else historic about the building. Okay. So she's okay with it. She, she's okay with it. Um, and we did check with our historian that's on staff now. She's the one that provided us with some of the information in the staff report as to the relevance of this structure. And? You want to elaborate on that? Uh, that it was part of a movement for a design build uh, Apartments of this sort when the city started expanding and that it's one of the last remaining uh, fourplexes of this style. Okay. So we, we have a motion and a second on the table uh, to approve the application based on the fact that the, the building is not historically significant. Can um, everyone that would like to vote for this motion say yay? Yay. Any those that are against this say nay. nay. Okay, so we've got a uh, the motion fails. We need another motion. I'll make a motion to deny the application on the basis that the project does not meet the development guidelines of the downtown design district and that that building is in fact architecturally significant. Okay. Um, come forward. Uh, I don't want to violate parliamentary procedure, but I do have a question. Um, if this building were to be proven by the National Park Service as, as not historically significant, would that carry weight with this committee? I think it would, but that would probably be setting a precedence that we don't have in our procedure now that we could incorporate it if we need to. Right now, we rely on our intensive level survey that was done under the guidance of Catherine Montgomery. Uh, but if we, if you choose that we go to the uh, National Park Service each time we have a project that is has been identified as a historic resource, we can do that. I think the owner is saying that they, they would go to the National Park Service. That, that's right. I, I would, you know, I, I would basically make an application with them to ask them what their opinion is in the case of is it historically significant. Um, and see so the say. owner would be providing that additional information to us to help us make a decision. Documentation from that, from that department. Uh-huh. You know, I, I think I'd be satisfied just with SHPO, State Historic Preservation Office. I mean, they're, they're pretty diligent about what's going on in Oklahoma. Well, what, what I think I hear uh, the applicant saying is that they would like us to continue this until we had um, this I, additional documentation. I, I believe that that is what you're Would you're hearing anybody correctly. be willing to, uh, to go with the continuance? Okay, we've got a motion and a second. Is that satisfactory? Yeah, I think you need to take Stan's motion off the table first, though, if he made it. Oh, Stan, sorry. Did he ever get a second on that? Or Okay, I think it died. Okay, I'm just making sure that we... Okay, well, yeah, okay. <laughs> you, right. you kind of jumped Just in making there. sure. Okay. And then we need to continue it to a certain date. Um, I don't know how long it's going to we'll, take. We'll probably need 
60 days okay. to, well, get it, to get it all done. To meeting after next. Yeah, that that would, be the so would be the October. October meeting. Okay, so we've got a motion and a second. Tannenbaum Amesworth, that was the motion. Okay, all in favor? Any opposed? Okay. Okay, Th Thank thanks you very much. We'll see you in two months. The next item, 801 Northwest 9th Street. Welcome, Rod. Please state your name. Hi, Rod Baker, 2800 Northwest 36th Street. We uh, took into consideration the comments of the board from the last meeting, and um, a few of them were well, we showed the street trees for the regulations, identified the type of street trees, and uh, one of the main considerations, I guess, was transparency to the uh, surrounding area. So we modified the, the plans. Uh, at the west end, we showed windows in areas that we could put windows in. And um, to uh, be a better neighbor to the neighbor next door. On the front of the, on the 9th Street elevation, we added, we changed, we changed the windows right at the front to, uh, we lowered, there was a horizontal window there and we lowered, or we enlarged those windows. There's a, that's a little kitchen area in there and sink and stuff, so people can just look outside or close the curtains, one of the two. The, the uh, blinds. There's, uh, there is glass at the door so you can uh, see in and out. And then uh, on the east end, we added glass in various areas that we could based on the structural consideration for the building. And uh, so I think we added quite a bit of glazing without hindering the privacy of the, uh, of the people in the, the um, parking garages across the street. And uh, can <clears throat> You can see from that area over there, but I think they can uh, accommodate that with window coverings. I think those are the main issues. Is that right, Scotty? Yes. Yeah. So, Rod, can you review the materials? that are shown on this. Oh. I think I understand them, but I just would I'm like sorry, to... I'm sorry, we changed to met the metal exterior as well. So all I, the large panels... I forgot panels, about that part. Huh? All the large panels are metal? Yeah. No. Architectural metal? That's right. Mm -hmm. Does anybody have any questions? Those are, that's, that's wood, that's wood, wood slat material for, for a differentiation in the texture and for some little privacy issue there. Cedar? That's the cedar. Cedar plank yeah. with a dark cedar stain. Plank. Yeah. Like. And the louvers are the same or are they, the, move, the movable louvers, they are what material? I thought they were metal before. Uh, I don't think there's there hasn't been any change to that. Okay. Yeah. The metal panels are just smooth. Yes. Smooth. Yeah. The architect has used uh, both materials extensively, but uh, he probably agrees that the uh, metal will last about 100 years, probably. I don't know. Long, long, long past our time. <laughs> so. You know, I, I know the glazing is is um, 
not perhaps what it would be on a commercial building or what we would like to see as far as the transparency. But as far as I'm concerned for residential, you know, I understand up this close to the street that that's an entirely different, it's an entirely different product. It's an entirely, it's a residence. And so I'm really, I think it's adequate. I'm fine with that. And I appreciate the changes that you made. Thank you. Do I have a motion? Move to approve. Second. Okay. And before I go any further, um, are there any people in the gallery that would like to speak to this? Okay. We have a motion and a second to pro approve the applicant application. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you very much. Thanks, Rod. Huh? Yeah. That was yeah, so right. easy, right? Thanks very much. Yeah, come back and see us again. Okay, the next application is 1101 Broadway Avenue. What? He just likes those guys. Yeah, yeah, I'm a great public speaker. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, he's Brian Fitzsimmons, twenty seven twenty one North Walker, Fitzsimmons Architects. Do I start or do you start? Uh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Brian, and then Scotty will follow up. Okay. Well, this one I think is pretty darn exciting. So, uh, what we're applying for today is the. Uh, Approval to install a historically as accurate as we can a Buick sign that was originally on top of 1101 North Broadway. It's a two sided sign, one faces to the east, one faces to the south, marking the corner of the intersection. It will be constructed in box letters with applied neon. We did a light test two nights ago comparing different neon sources to LED, and neon is definitely the way to go. And uh, it will be the, what they call the emerald blue or something, which is basically the one that burns kind of a whitish blue, very similar to the Pontiac sign that's across the street on 1101. Um, part of the application is to ask for approval or recommendation for the uh, Board of Adjustments on the size and height of the sign relative also to allowing for some future signage on the ground level. Uh, the ground level signage is not designed yet specifically, although there's some conceptual information within your packet of, of how we could see that happening but tenant leases are just now beginning to be negotiated, so we do not know specifically what those signs will be, because it will be dependent on the, on the uh, tenant. The actual areas and type of sign is, is part of the application, and with each sign that would come with each tenant, it would be a separate application for separate review. And the, uh, the other variance is on the height with the type of roof mounted sign with the building height, you're only allowed by zoning to go six feet above the parapet. This, in order to be historically accurate, is obviously higher than six feet. So. Brian, is that do you have um, like locations on the roof that that indicate that that's where the sign was? I mean, is there some kind of? Uh, we look. There's a couple of oddball penetrations, not knowing exactly where those posts are, but within. The application there is a historic photo and doing the best job we could of scaling off the photo in perspective what's before you today is as accurate as we know we've also uh, did research um, for the type of signs that would have been around then in the actual Buick logo and so this is based upon that logo that they would have used from the, the 20s up to around the 40s, which is the 
time period this would have been installed. Yeah, the, uh, there's a Buick building, which is where Red Prime is. That was the original showroom. That one building dated from 1911, I believe, plus or minus maybe 15. And then this building was 1924. They moved on to a bigger, better facility is basically what happened. So. Yeah, the Buick building down south on, on Broadway has that sign in the in the castone. castone but it's it has that big red prime yeah, yeah. Sign. i think as far as kind of identification the southern buick building is clearly identified as red prime steakhouse as far as how it is known so, so you're really not even asking us to approve the uh, additional signage because we, you have no idea. No, we're only, okay. as far as the immediate CA, we're asking for approval to erect the roof sign. And then a recommendation for the variance required that would be dealing with area and height, knowing that future um, signage will be individually applied for within those parameters outlined in the variance. Okay. Mike. This sign we want to do now, and then the future signs would be at street level on the canopies, oh. identifying individual tenants. I don't really want anybody to hear me. <laughs> Sorry. Any other questions from the committee? Are there any questions or comments from the gallery? Do we have a motion? Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Now we need to do a continuance for the second half of that. Is that right? The recommendation for the variance. Yeah, we gave a recommendation for a variance in that motion. Is that all right? You did the continuance? You can do that. Okay, I didn't hear the continuance part. Okay, congratulations. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the next application is 409 Park Place. Is the applicant present? Larry Pickering, 312 Northeast 37th. Um, here to uh, obtain approval for the Midtown Mutts Dog Park at 409 West Park Place. We presented this as a presentation last month, and now we're here for approval to move forward with installing um, the facility. There is a variance uh, issue with the fence. If we could see the site plan. Um, the variance, the uh, fence ordinance says no chain link fence on the street frontage. Uh, we've placed the fence on this particular property away from the street frontage on West Park Place. That's in anticipation of construction along Park Place for new projects. So the fence really sits pretty far back from the road. That will also be landscaped as landscape screening. The rest of the fence is uh, one property away from the Hudson side. It's on the alley side, and it's isolated on the west side. We are providing landscape screening on both the south and east sides of the property. We have also added um, a uh, sidewalk, a hard surface sidewalk from the Hudson um, Street access across the, um, along the alleyway on the property that's owned by the, uh, by the owner. So it uh, shows a concrete sidewalk and then it shows crushed granite on the extension across the alley, is that Crushed correct? granite across the alley is simply for uh, temporary access 
just in case there's any work there, you can't put, you know, when you want to put a hard surface across the alleyway. Okay. That's why we put the one to Hudson. Uh, the parking lot on the southwest corner of 11th and Hudson can be utilized by park uh, patrons. But we anticipate most of those people are going to be from the Midtown area and they're going to be walking their dogs. Okay. We do have an active water meter uh, that was already in place, an active water line. Uh, that's been verified by the city as live and active, so uh, that's ready to go as far as getting in the, uh, the hydration uh, water station. And along with the original presentation, west, uh, waste receptacles and uh, storage and everything will be uh, provided at the site. Great. Scotty? Okay, our recommendation is for approval with the condition that he uh, substitute approval of materials for the fencing because it still, this project does still have street frontages and chain links are still not permitted. So he um, indicated that he was exploring other metal, other types of fencing that would be appropriate, uh, but because of the temporary nature wanted to stay with chain link, but we still think that this was set a, uh, a precedence that would be picked up by other residents who um, have animals, pets that need to be re restrained within a certain area. So we'd like to have him replace that material with something that, that is approvable. We, we do have a precedent of the, for a variance with the uh, basketball um, courts that's down on Reno that's also vinyl chain link fence. And that There's was, this, uh, that was granted a is four it, year. Is it plastic it's, covered? It's vinyl coated chain link. And the idea with the chain link was simply, as these properties are developed by the owner, all of this can be rolled up, put in the container, and moved to another site. It is a dog park in a box. So other materials are not going to be conducive to that use. We're going to have to do those in panels or whatever, and plus the, uh, the cost issue of those. So with the precedent of the, of the uh, basketball court on Reno, we felt like How tall, how tall a fence? That's uh, a four foot. Actually, my dog is big and she won't jump a four foot fence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's small dogs just like. Um, so that, that was kind of the thinking on it. It's just, it's just it's portable. We roll it up and we move it. So the, you know, and the, it's a temporary location, so. Any other questions from the committee? Any comments from the gallery? What did we do with the the basketball court? Did we get, did they, they have to get a variance? variance? Yes. Okay. And so your options are to approve it, deny it, or approve it with the condition that either they substitute the material or that they apply for a variance to this um, material and then offer a recommendation to the Board of Adjustment for a variance to this material as well. Okay. Tough choices, guys. Need a motion. All right, I move approval the way she said it. Yeah. Honey, um, you need to do it. If she gets, there were three you need choices to do it. Yeah. 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 Too many choices. <laughs> the third choice where Approval, you period. need to apply for a variance on the Board of Adjustment, <laughs> correct? With the condition that they get a variance? Yes. To the material? Is, is that not on the agenda that they're recommending a variance? No, it is not. That's what it says, and a recommendation for a variance to the fencing. Hold on. So we're, we're recommending. And is it black, Larry, by the way? Yes. It's black. Yes. Can they make a recommendation to the Board of Adjustment at this meeting? Does that have to be? Well, it's on the agenda. I'm reading it on the agenda as, um, okay. and provide a recommendation for a variance to the fencing regulations. Okay. So, okay, we so can I think do you that could as recommend a separate that. motion. Yes. So we've, we've got a motion to approve the, uh, the application as it stands as long as they receive a variance on the fencing. Is that correct? Second. Okay, that was Connie and Chuck. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? 
Thank you. Thanks very much. Wait, we have one more thing to do. Now we need the, the recommendation to the Board of Adjustment, if we choose to do it. Question? Yep. Question? Yeah. Okay. The recommendation, the motion passed that I have to go to get a variance. Right. This motion, with that set of precedent, that vinyl coated chain link fence and a temporary use would be approved without review from here on out. No. Anything that requires because I think a variance you know, I'm, I'm just asking because, you know, you're. No, anything that requires a variance is definitely going to have to be approved. Um, I'm already good with the variance because I've got to go get a variance now. For okay, you guys. so we need we need to make a motion for the variance. But that wasn't in your motion. Okay, so I make a recommendation that he apply for a variance for the chain link fence. That we either. Okay, that we recommend approval of a variance to the Board of Adjustment. Okay. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you very much. Thank Connie you. is now a seasoned veteran of <laughs> motion making. By the way, I think this is a very cool deal. I do too. And we're getting excited about one of the items we're going to see at the end of this. So um, the next item is South Robinson Street between West Reno and Southwest Third, hi Kelly. Not Kelly, Karina Henderson, okay. 211 North Robinson for the Oklahoma City Thunder. You wanna uh, tell us about your project? Absolutely, this really started for us as a practical matter. We are, as everyone knows, moving our offices from Leadership Square into the arena in a few short months. And we started asking the question of the people administering the building, how do we get our mail once we move? And we realized that nobody really gets mail at the arena right now, nobody offices there. Um, it's delivered either to the Cox building across the street or packages are delivered via the loading dock. And so we were trying to figure out how we allowed the post office to find our front door, which the address of the building is 100 West Reno, our doors are not at 100 West Reno, they're facing Robinson. So in our talks with SMG, they asked, well, had you considered, you know, doing a change to a street name that would reflect your business? And once we knew that was a possibility, obviously we're excited about that. That's an, we're an international brand. This is something that would reflect very positively on the relationship that the city has with our team and with our brand, and so we pursued it from there um, and just looked at all the options, and this was the one that was available to us that we knew to change the name of Robinson um, and just went through the consideration process that's laid out in the application um, to have it reflect basketball values. Um, you know, drive is a basketball reference. Obviously, the 208 number would be within the parameters that we had laid out for us, and it's similar to our um, 2008 established year. Um, so, you know, this is really for us, it started out as just a matter of where do we get mail um, when we move. But, you know, obviously it's of larger importance for the city and just reflects the deep ties that we have with the city, with the fans, with the people here. And we're, you know, very excited about the possibility, just honored and humbled that this would be even considered. Would this be South Thunder Drive or just Thunder Drive because there's no other Thunder Drive? M to my knowledge, it's just Thunder Drive. Um, do we have any questions? Oh, no, Scotty, you want to talk about it? Uh, we're happy with it. Okay. <laughs> Um, I move that we uh, provide a recommendation to the City account Council to approve the renaming to 208 Thunder Drive. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Great. Thank you for coming. Thank you. The next item. Oh, no. I've lost my staff report. Um, would the next applicant come forth? Oh, here it is. 
Um, oh, we're, we're down to other business. Is that correct? Yes. Am I right? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. This is our lost my place. Um, we want to provide. We did. We already did that. Uh, provide recommendation to the planning commission. Proposed ordinance for outdoor sales and display. Do we have a presentation on that? No, we do not. Um, this is basically to reduce the extent of the restriction on outdoor sales around the memorial to pull that boundary in closer to the memorial to allow uh, outdoor activity when they have special events that either honor the memorial or are appropriate to the memorial. Um, and in your packet there's a map that shows this last page of the ordinance for 7B that shows the difference between the original scope of the limitation and the new revised. Okay. Is there a downside to this? Not that I can see. Do we have any comments or questions? So this is a permanent boundary change so it could be for any event that is carried on there not just right. they have to get a special permit so they'll go through an, another level of uh, scrutiny another before. process right so the thought process is really for the memorial run and other things other, right other events that would be associated with the memorial right or that, or would not be inappropriate for that area well and so there's an addition they have to get a special permit that was, right. that answers my so the activities on a, um, Hudson and 8th Street have had, were they violating this or? Okay. What activities? All righty. Any other questions? You want a motion for approval? Is that? Yes. We go. Like recommendation of approval to the Planning Commission and City Council for this ordinance amendment. I move to recommend to the Planning Commission that the, uh, the uh, site be modified for signage. The ordinance amendment? Ordinance. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here again. Great. Thank you. We'll be looking down so we can see your presentation. Yeah, I was uh, used to that. <laughs> yeah. Should be the first time. So my name is Aaron Young with Rogers Marvel Architects. Um, is I think many of the committee members I've seen before, although I think there's a new committee member maybe recently since the last time I've been here. Um, so it's a pleasure to present this. We have presented some concept plans in the past, and I'm really excited to show you these updates. We have been through the design development phase in which the Department of Public Works, and particularly Michael Clark, has led us through a very broad series of meetings with everybody from parks to arts to staff on various projects, city planning, local stakeholders, and it's actually been a very rewarding process and is reflected in the specific points, I could say, that the tenants for the park design that we'll look at today. Um, in terms of trajectory, I believe we're going to be back to you in a month seeking final approval. Um, and the overall schedule for the park is we've tried very hard with the construction of the building at 120 Kerr and the surrounding streetscape packages for Project 180 to sequence all of this so that the adjacent property owners aren't living through three rounds of construction, but really kind of try to get it all as close together as we can. So we hope that this park, uh, if approved, would be completing around the third quarter, late third quarter of next year. So with that, I'll jump in. Um, so the park, it's always, oops, I don't know how I, oh, I scroll. 
Um, it's always been useful to me to look at this image because it let us talk about the layers that existed in the prior park from the service drive on couch to the, the park that was a part of couch park to the walls and steps that really surrounded Kerr Park. And from our earliest meetings with city planning, one tenant really emerged and it was how do we make more park out of this? Because this space and this diagram you can see was really separated into three or four distinct zones. And the overall idea was that even through simple material continuity, whoops, we can begin to, to construct an atmosphere where there's one single park with a much more generous environment while maintaining necessary service functions like the drive on couch. The next aspect was really how do you shelter public life? How do you begin to encourage people to spend more time outdoors um, in an area where you do in fact have very high street level winds, um, sun, uh, can drive public life indoors as well. So as with other projects, we've looked back to very regional examples, the windbreaks of the Great Plains, which have 40 years worth of data behind their development. And back in 2011, when we developed some very concept placeholders for the park, um, we took that to Denver and ran it through a wind tunnel test so, we, so that we could understand if windbreaks were here or here and how they were positioned, how they would affect the the, the low-level winds within the park, and that led to the development of a windbreak strategy to divert the higher-level winds over the major public spaces while allowing a little bit of breeze through. I have to qualify that by saying that usually happens about 10 or 12 years into the growth of some of the trees and probably not on day one when they're little suckers. Um, along with that, the development of the park is how do we enliven every season? One of the issues that we heard over and over with the prior park is that at a certain time in the fall, the water features would turn off and the park felt like it was closed, closed for the season. So how do we really ensure that the life of the park is maintained more, uh, more times of the day and more times of the year? And with that, this is just an example, but came a solar study across the park really for every hour of every day of the entire year. And our landscape architect insisted on that so that they could understand what's going to grow because it does receive a significant amount of shade throughout the year. So from those studies emerged a plan that really looked at the park seasonally. How do we begin to organize planting so that in the winter you get the really beautiful paper quality of the river birch trees and some of the blues of the, of the evergreens. Um, spring, which is always an amazing time, but you help enliven that by, you know, the use of some native trees, Oklahoma red buds, um, and then the differentiate some of the colors between bald cypress and other oaks. Um, summer, again, a range of greens throughout the park and some low ground cover that flower throughout the season. And then fall, of course. And with fall came a particular challenge and one that we were very keen on, on developing, and that was ensuring that the plant species didn't all change color at one time, but really stretch that change out over time so that fall becomes a season in the park that's not just two weeks out of the year, but is two months out of the year. And then that helped us develop a basic plan, which is the plan that you see before you for the park that we're really looking at today in this presentation. And I'll describe the pieces and parts of the park. Um, it was important to develop an everyday destination for this part of downtown so that we didn't duplicate all of the active programs in Myriad Gardens, nor duplicate the ceremonial quality of Bicentennial Park. So that led us to develop in concert with the Parks Department and City Planning um, a program for the park that really focused on everyday uses, open seating for lunchtime, a gathering lawn, um, the windbreaks on the, on the eastern side to really shelter that lawn, um, provisions for some of the artwork that's in the park, and I'll walk through some of these programs. Um, the, law, the passive lawn on the site has been organized to mitigate the grade change from couch, which is about eight and a half feet below Kerr to the north, so that it forms a natural amphitheater. But it's an amphitheater that allows you to be there individually and feel like the space is comfortable rather than empty. Um, it is also the kind of space that will allow for medium scale to large gatherings. And this is my optimistic photo from, uh, from Prospect Park in Brooklyn of you know, larger scale movie night gatherings. 
It has to accommodate scalable venues because the last thing you want is to have a band out there, you know, midday in the fall and have 12 people watching and have it feel empty. You know, you want it to really accommodate whatever activity is, is going on. It was one of the great things about, you know, the former park as I listened to different people who used to work at Kerr McGee and others uh, like Rick Brown who's with us who, you know, remember the bands and activities that would take place from time to time. And it worked great in that amphitheater, but only when that occurred, because when that didn't occur, the amphitheater was not, didn't really have a purpose and a function, was empty and served as a place to, to hide. Uh, holiday events. You know, this used to be the site of the downtown Christmas tree, um, which I think has now been in Bricktown for some years. And whether or not that comes back, I don't know. But the provision to allow for major events in the middle of downtown or in this area of downtown is something that we were keen on recognizing. And so we just we have allowed provisions both for power and space to accommodate that. And then also intimate events. I was actually surprised to learn from the Parks Department that they had a number of requests for weddings in Couch Park um, prior to the recent work. And so we worked on developing a couple of scenarios where you could have a small gathering, have a procession, have the photo opportunity against some beautiful landscape to really come and accommodate those uh, sessions. And then lunchtime gatherings, I think a critical aspect of this park, directly across from the food service and Leadership Square and Cool Greens, other future restaurants, and really to provide a sheltered grove so that you can come underneath the dappled shade of the Durahee River Birch, um, loose tables and chairs, and really enjoy uh, lunchtime. Uh, and I actually think a lot of the summer as well, because this does receive a lot of shade from the buildings directly to the south. Um, it was also really, really critical to make the park accessible for everyone. Um, if you remember the former park, it was really divided, you know, eight and a half feet worth of steps from north to south. And if you, if my grandmother wanted to go to Kerr Park, she had to go out to the sidewalk, up and around, and try to get up. So in the redesign of the park, it's important to accommodate everyone that we think might use the park. And so as we look at the park plan, I'm going to highlight the pathways within the park in blue and just note that now every pathway in the park is completely accessible. So you're able to move from Couch below up to Kerr, um, from Kerr to Broadway along generous and accessible pathways. Um, the plan also maintains the service drive function of Couch Drive for the south, um, which has become a necessary function for a lot of the property owners along the south side of the park. Um, in developing the material palette for the park, we've been talking with the folks at Myriad Gardens, um, Parks Department and others to understand now that they've been living with that for a year or so, what's worked, what hasn't, what are the lessons that we can learn as we work on a public space that really at the end when it's delivered needs to be somewhat bulletproof for maintenance purposes. Um, so we're actually looking at using, you see in the background there, some native Oklahoma sand, uh, sandstone to begin to develop a kind of rocky outcropping, a planter within that, that urban canyon, um, accommodating benches and low ground cover within the planter. We're also deferring to the palette of Project 180 in that area. Um, one of the things that I feel very strongly about is that, you know, this park is public space. And the city has set up a really beautiful hierarchy along, I think, Harvey and Robinson that uses the tan pavers instead of the gray pavers in Project 180. And so we're uh, proposing to extend those tan pavers from Robinson throughout the park. So when you move up Robinson, you immediately understand that this park is a continuation of the public realm of that civic spine along Robinson, um, along with the cast iron castings and gratings that are part of the vocabulary of Project 180. Um, public art is a very important component in public parks, and this park had a series of sculptures. Um, I believe this will be reviewed with the Art Commission shortly. Um, and three of the three that I'd like to talk about are The Pioneers of 1889 by Leonard McMurray, the Air Force Memorial by the same artist, and then the, the statue of Robert S. Kerr by Donahoe. Um, the pioneers of 1889 and, you know, the, the Air Force Memorial on the eastern side of the park, what I love about those two pieces is that they're beautiful bronzes. And to have the park bookended by the same artist I think is a pretty unique opportunity. Um, we visited with Clay Farha, whose family donated the, the pioneers of 1889 statue 
um, I think back in 1959, um, to talk about resetting that statue. Because right now it's seven, seven feet high, it is itself a seven foot statue, and your relationship to it is, is kind of skewed. Um, we also felt that it could be much more dramatic if it were paired with something that, that elevated the context of the sculpture um, relative to its original intent. And so you can see here an image of that reset sculpture in a low grassy mound of native grasses. And in visiting with Mr. Fairhow, we met certain requirements that he had for the security of the statue, the elevation of the statue, and he's let us know that he's very pleased with this, uh, with this outcome. The other thing about this sculpture is that it has never been lit. And I think the, we're working with a lighting designer who's done a lot of work with us here locally, um, who does a lot of museum and sculpture lighting, and commented that, you know, the, the deep carvings in the bronze really just cry out to be lit really well at night. And so using a single focal point to address the horse, the child, and the pioneer all at one time at light so that this statue has a presence even at night. Um, the Air Force Monument by Leonard McMurray as well, over on the eastern side, will be set within the grove of trees. It will have a small paved, I'd say a plazaette almost, that leads to it so that you can be up close to the bronze. And it will be lit in a similar fashion with lighting really facing the, the bronze, which I believe in 1963 was a high school student local high school student that posed for McMurray for this, for this statue. And then the bust of Robert Kerr, which has always been displayed, actually I think a little unfortunately. Um, it's very difficult to stand and read the text and see the bust and understand that this six foot four man is now at three foot six, you know, high. Um, so we're actually looking to relocate that to I think a more prominent corner, one of the entry corners at the corner of Kerr and Broadway and we're working on a plan to reset the statue so that the bust is at a six foot four height elevation and the plaque is in front of you and that will be reviewed with the Art Commission for, uh, through Robbie Kinzel for their uh, comments. Um, the last element, actually next to last element, is that I always get these questions even from people in our office, why is this swath so wide um, in the middle of Oklahoma City? And I, you know, it's because the rail lines ran through what was the northern part of downtown, which now uh, resides in the middle of downtown. And so one of the things that we'd like to do is actually memorialize those railways. Um, so that we're going to include some cast iron markers in the paving that just indicate the quotation marks, you know, that would and talk about the rail lines and a plaque that talks about the history of that space. Um, the last element of the park is that I think just like we try to extend the seasonal life of the park, we also try to extend the life of the park throughout the day. And that actually comes through lighting and making the park an inviting place or a safe place at night. So to cast an inviting glow is quite important. And this image shows the Project 180 lighting surrounding the park and the lighting within the park. And the two strategies are that the grove, that kind of lunchtime grove, really gets uh, illuminated, kind of punched a little bit so that it becomes a beacon at night. The lawn panel gets illuminated by moonlight so that we get just a half a foot candle or so of beautiful light so that you can see this slightly green patch even at night so it doesn't feel closed uh, after a certain point in time. And this image taken from the corner of Robinson and Broadway shows you those two conditions. And then this image taken from Broadway looking along Couch Drive towards the, towards the Grove. Just a detail of that lighting at the base of a, of a conceptual idea for the, the stone walls and the uplighting of the trees in the Grove. And that actually concludes the presentation for the park. I'm happy to answer any questions. I know we'll be back to you in a month for final approval. Ma'am? Go for it. Oh, I just uh, was wondering, you, you mentioned that the uh, completion of this would be the third quarter of next year, mm -hmm. and you've coordinated with MAPS as far as disruption of the streets and everything. When is the five-story going to be completed? Uh, that will be, that's running around the same time period, like end of the third quarter of next year. Is, the, is still the current target. Great. So the idea is that we're, we're enclosed on that, which allows us to do a lot of the finish work in the park, and those two things are resolved at the same time, save any tenant improvements. I think it's fantastic, and I thank you, because I'm moving into the 29th floor of City Place, so <laughs> thanks for my own private park. <laughs> no problem. So there's a, uh, you indicate the keeping the vehicular access on one side, but it appears that there's not really a street. Can you go into that a little bit? 
Well, uh, yeah, so the, the roadway exists, um, and uh, see the roadway and an eight-foot zone for loading and unloading and or parallel parking uh, remains, as well as the sidewalk between the southern property owners and that that uh, right away. I can flip back. Yeah, like can we to, flip to a plan? Sure. So that Let me just go to this one right here. So on this plan, you'll see this is the curb line of the existing sidewalk. Right. And we're going to treat that the same way that Project 180 is, with concrete against the buildings and the pavers out to the curb. There is an eight-foot zone that sets out loading and unloading and or parallel parking. And then there is the zone that, it, that remains couch drive. The only difference here is that we're paving it in the same materials. We're letting the unit pavers change direction uh, for each of those zones. And we're lining one side, like this side is lined with tree trunks, and this will actually have some cast iron vehicular bollards, the 24-inch high bollards that are indicators for vehicles that the park is not a parking area. Um, but just that simple tonal continuity means that the idea of park takes precedence over service drive. So there is still is a curb. There still is a curb. Yes, that curb exists here, only on the southern side. The curb does not exist on the northern side. On the northern side, it's bounded by, like I said, tree trunks and the low bollards with the detectable warnings along that edge because those edges are set with the cast iron detectable warning plates that are used in Project 180, which I like that, that delineation, that very clear delineation. And we, we kept the curb on the southern side because water management issues. I don't in any way want to end up with water from the park. As we know from recent storms, moving further into, you know, property owners on the southern side. So parking will be allowed? I think that that's, that's something we're leaving to the city. Okay. We've accommodated the, the allowances for those things. I just have to ask, you said you're using tree trunks basically as bollards? Well, the, if you can see in this area of the plan, there is a small grove of river birch. And they're multi-stem trees, so each one of them has three trunks. And basically what you want to do in an area like this, just from other public space work we've done, is give a clear signal that this is not a vehicular way. So the trees are spaced within a proximity that doesn't allow for vehicles to drive into that zone. It will also be set with loose tables and chairs, like the tables and chairs on the north side of Project 180. Or sorry, of uh, Myriad Gardens, I mean. Any other questions? Thanks for presenting thank it to us. Yeah, thank you very it's much. Very exciting. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Look forward to seeing you in a month. Never enough for Connie. Um, our next presentation um, is Eric Smith. Now this is exciting. Before you get too excited, I need to qualify this a little bit. When they first came to us with this, I was excited. I thought this was something the committee needed to see. So we tried to get them on the presentation agenda. After checking zoning, this is as close as you're going to get to it because it is not in the design district. It is a PUD. So I would like you to enjoy this and, and see that this is maybe the wave of the future that we'll be seeing more of in, in the Oklahoma City and the downtown design district. We are going to have more container uh, structures, and I'd like to get some input on you uh, from you uh, on this design and this, this material. Uh, again, my name is Eric Schmid. I office at 726 West Sheridan. I'm with Alford, Hall, Mana, and Morris Architects. Um, first, I'd like to say thanks for having me. I know uh, this is kind of weird that I'm presenting to you and you don't have power over whether we get approved or not. We will be going through permitting process, which will review our PUD. But I thought it was important to um, discuss how Oklahoma City uses currently vacant parking lots and how we can add density to our city that um, provides benefit, ta tax base um, in the interim before larger, more viable options are available on certain properties. Um, you all are well aware that there is a lot of surface parking in Oklahoma City and 
Uh, we think this is a really exciting project that will add vibrancy to a neighborhood that's already growing, perhaps the best multi-use neighborhood in downtown Oklahoma City. And so um, I just wanted to present this project to you, um, get your feelings. Perhaps we can use you as um, an alliance when we go up against Code Council and our PUD, especially for zoning and how it fits in with, with our current PUD. So uh, this is the project. We're calling it OKC. Um, those are shipping containers. It's a pun. It's a pretty funny one. Uh, these are nine foot six tall by 40 foot shipping containers. Uh, they might be one use or new. We have a, a local supplier. Um, and we think this is a really great opportunity to provide some pop-up retail and commercial space in a very underutilized um, site. So the site is located um, just north of all of the really great development happening in Deep Deuce. This is obviously level urban apartments. Mosaic has dug a large lake currently here. Uh, Maywood Apartments are doing phase one here as well as I'm, I'm sure you all are aware after they've presented phase two over here. Uh, our owner owns this giant flat iron site and we've worked with him for a number of years to try and develop a very successful profitable scheme that would include shopping, retail, uh, perhaps some mixed use, uh, maybe including some, some residences. But um, he's a little bit nervous in the interim developing the site and we're trying to find a way to add a little density, some vibrancy to the neighborhood um, that currently is a lot of residential. Uh, this is a gas station site, uh, if you're aware of. And this is a large surface parking lot as well as another large surface parking lot, which isn't currently used and it just sits vacant every day. Well, this is a, a staging platform for this development currently. So what we've developed here is a series of three units. Um, each unit is approximately 1,200 square feet. So this could be considered one uh, office or perhaps a small retail space. Um, and they're all worked around sort of a series of public amenity parks. So if this was perhaps a small bar or coffee shop, you could have outdoor seating. Um, and they all share one private public amenity, which would be the restrooms. Um, on the upstairs, we've developed a series of rooftop terraces, so each unit gets their own private up upstairs terrace uh, with views that have been geared back towards downtown. I guess what also would be important to discuss is this site acts as a gateway for downtown Oklahoma City. Harrison, in the morning, gets a lot of traffic from folks traveling south on 235 that exit to go into downtown. And so it acts as a gateway, it acts as a welcome mat to downtown, and we think this project could really set a nice precedent, an example of Oklahoma City is forward thinking and how we utilize abandoned uh, parking lots in perhaps a temporary situation. We have no intention of this building existing 50 years down the line, 20 years down the line, 15 years down the line. This is a temporary solution that we think is vibrant. It's creating a, a place, not just a space, uh, with all these really great punched openings, really great daylighting for these units. Um, we think it'll just be a really amazing, great space to be. Um, so the parking lot exists. We're going to put these things down on the parking lot. Very minimal site work. Um, the curb cuts that currently exist will be utilized as spaces for food trucks, pop-up vendors, um, to really enliven these courtyards that we've established. We're looking into utilizing um, oil drums as a way to um, protect the undercroft of these, of these containers. The site's not flat, so it's not like we're just dropping these right on the ground. We have to create some sort of substantial foundation for it to work. So by utilizing these reused oil drums, it's, it maintains the idea of transportation and shipping. And we'll, we'll plant uh, native species in these 
uh, to help enliven the space. This would be your view looking south down Harrison. So this would be your view every morning if you uh, take Harrison into downtown from 235. The boxes uh, also have little private terraces upstairs. We're looking at ways to perforate this terrace so that at night the whole box kind of glows like a jewel box and is a beacon to kind of the cool industrial quality that Oklahoma City has. It's, you can see here that each tenant will have large natural daylighting, private amenity roof terraces. We're going to do all sorts of fun graphics all over the thing to make it pop, make it exciting, and um, we're really excited about the project. So, like Scotty said, Unfortunately, I wish I was in a DDRC footprint, but I'm not. I'm in a PUD. Um, but I just wanted to make sure that you all were well aware that this was going on. Um, it's a pretty exciting project, and we value your opinion, and we want to make sure that you guys are on the same page with what's going on in Oklahoma City. This is really exciting. Um, I read some articles on pop-up stores and containers that uh, really gives the opportunity to activate the street and, and kind of give a taste of what it would be like to have retail along spaces um, that are you know currently not activated so I'm I think it's cool I mean, I share the, you know, the the imagery is all very exciting and very nice and looking uh, very interesting. I do want to uh, caution you, if you've never built with containers before, there's more to it than you think. It seems like you could just punch holes and put windows in and be done, but there's m way more to it, and it ends up costing not far from what it would be to build a proper place, you know. so. There's a perceived big savings there that, um, you know, that is probably a false sense of security when it comes to the financial end of things. So anyway, just I hope it I hope it happens. It's it's exciting. So Stan, have you done this before? Have you? Yeah, I, we, uh, uh, I agree with your sentiment. Uh, we, this, is, this has been a long time coming, actually. Um, a lot of work with structural engineers to try and it's not as straightforward as it looks. And, and, and we understand that. I but think we are excited about it. The thing that I think would be the beauty of it is the, if, unless it, the temporary nature of it, and if you build with bricks and mortar, all of a sudden it seems harder to remove that and put something more substantial in its place. But I don't know, maybe that's, is that not possible? Is it, does it become permanent when you do that?
Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it. I appreciate that. Uh, as far as vehicular traffic being right there next to it, and you mentioned that there would be very little civil site work that would be done, is that really uh, safe? Uh, with you, you have those picnic tables there, you know, no curves, just that one planter. You're, you're talking about here and here? Yeah. Um, you know, that's a good question. Uh, there's, there's definitely, we perceive that if this is going to be a publicly safe area, that the users should be safe. They shouldn't be hit by traffic. Uh, obviously, that's been considered. Currently, there are a series of bollards and planters along in here. Uh, they have pretty ugly kind of bollard and chain. Um, that will be addressed. There's no doubt that um, public safety and user safety and tenant safety as well as container safety is, is one of our concerns. Um, so it will be addressed. Well, thanks for bringing it to us, even though we will never hear it. Other oh, you'll see it, though. We'll see it, though, yeah. Thank you very much. Very good. Our next regular meeting is September 19th. The applications were submitted uh, on Tuesday. The, well, normally not, and it's been a long meeting. Is, is there, are there any administrative approvals that you feel like you need to address? I don't think so. Okay. Um, once again, I want to thank Stan for his service, and maybe he'll come back to us when he is returning to Oklahoma City. Any other communication before we close? We are adjourned. <laughs>